About 450 million people worldwide currently suffer from a mental health condition, making it one of the leading causes of ill health. Mothers are especially vulnerable to depression. They face a disabling disease at a time when they are most needed by their families. And seeking help is not always easy due to the stigma surrounding depression, as well as a fear of looking like an incompetent mother. Raising awareness around maternal mental health allows us to change the narrative around the realities of motherhood. That motherhood is not all cuddles and baby kisses, but can be filled with sleepless nights, personal sacrifice, and self-doubt. Fortunately, depression is highly treatable, and with the right help, all mothers can heal, thrive, and live fulfilling lives. I thought of harming the child physically, and that's when my therapist sent me to a psychiatrist because I felt like maybe if, if the baby is not there, then I'll be fine. But I'd not throw her out of the window alone. If she goes, I go. Because I can't live with that guilt and the shame. So if we go, we go together. So I'd not be allowed to be with her alone in a room. I'm Christine Kimani Kabuye. I am 31 years, very proud. <laughs> I am a mother, I'm a wife, I'm a daughter, I'm a sister, and yeah, I love life. I'm just discovering myself every day. So what led me to finding out I was pregnant was I developed some pain very discom very very uh, a discomfort that i can't explain so i had to go and get checked and well they found out i was expectant um so when the doctor told me i'm expectant he told me uh, the reason i'm experiencing the kind of pain i'm experiencing was because the baby was not growing where the baby is supposed to grow so yeah, so I found out that I was having that issue and I was told to go back after two weeks to see if the baby has taken its rightful place. And when I did that, and when I went back, the baby had taken its rightful place. So what does, it, what does this mean? I am going to be pregnant, I am fine, we'll go the whole way. So the first trimester was really hard. And actually all through till my nine months, I developed hyperemesis. So I was in and out of hospital. I was always tired. At that time I was working and I'm in media. So having to tell your boss or your producer that you can't make it for work, you can't go on air and it's a live program, you know, that was just, it was hard. Um, so I didn't feel like doing anything um, throughout the nine months. Um, there are days I didn't want to wake up and there are days I just wanted to stay in bed. Throughout that nine month period, I talked to a few moms and I kept asking them, when do I develop this bond that people experience? Cause I had a circle of pregnant women, friends, and they were so excited about their pregnancies. But I'm like, why am I not excited? Why am I not feeling any connection? You know? So... There are times you'd see a mom, you know, touching her belly and, you know, really excited, can't wait to see the baby. But I didn't experience any of that. I was expecting something to come. I don't know, I thought something would come and then I would just be flooded with something, you see. I don't know, I just felt like I, I was waiting for something to come and take over and just have this love you know and i thought it would come immediately the child was born and then when that didn't happen i felt that there was something wrong with me or i didn't love my child and i i remember initially starting to panic about if i'm able to be a mother my name is wamboy june lamo so wamboy jl for short which is my personal brand which many people in recent years have come to know i'm a woman i'm a daughter sister i'm a wife a mother a friend and yeah um, I think the 
for a very for a, a, a short period of time in the last few years i which i can discuss later i kind of lost my identity so it's always good to introduce myself as a woman because that's what i am first um yeah so that's me first pregnancy you have no idea what you're doing you've read you've tried to read some books but you know it's a different experience by the second pregnancy it came my second child came uh very close to the first one so i hadn't even like healed from the first one and um it took me to be honest a bit longer than i expected to really settle into quote and quote motherhood into the cuddles into the hug you know that feeling that that thing you're asking about the 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 cuddles that that pink love hearts everywhere to be honest it took me a while and i remember thinking there's something wrong with me because it it's not, that's not what we are told we are told immediately the child comes you'll just have this overwhelming thing coming over you you know i don't even know what it was i was expecting and now i know it comes in its own way subsequent births with the second and third born same thing happens um but this time i'm a bit i'm like i've seen this thing before it's still it's still a bit disheartening cause you're still waiting for that gooey gooey feeling oh my gosh um yeah so it it it's the beginning of where i think i started thinking i'm not good enough to be a mom and it was not an interest it wasn't a nice thing to go through at that time so i had to be induced I was going to have a natural um bath um but all along funny enough throughout my pregnancy I wanted a CS a cesarean section because I did not want to have to experience the pain of childbirth um but talking to people you know people would discourage me oh no you know uh the natural way is the best way to go don't hope for such things But I was like but that's what I want. I don't want to have to go through that physical pain. And you know I had a friend tell me, you know, if it's for someone you love, a child, you know, you'll go through what you need to go through so that you're the best mom, so that you have, you know, you don't have to have those healing. You know, you don't have to take time to heal. Um you can still walk after the baby is delivered. So, yeah. so stop hoping for that method of 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 childbirth start hoping for this other method but for me i really didn't want to go through the natural way of giving birth um but by 7 months my doctor my obgyn told me listen you're the perfect candidate for a natural birth you're not going to have a cs so please start preparing your mind to have a natural birth So that kind of put me off so I didn't want to go through it. But anyway, fast forward the day comes and I have to be induced. So I labored for four intense hours. So they broke my water at 8:30. I remember the day very well. It was a Sunday, a cold Sunday in the month of May. So they broke my water at 8:30 and at 12:55 the baby was there. So it was just a very painful process. and something that again I am not sure I want to go through again. And yeah, the baby came at 12:55. I looked at her. I waited for the bond. I waited for the connection. I waited to relate to you know the skin to skin. I just couldn't I I didn't find myself feeling some type of way. So I was told to breastfeed my child while I was in the delivery room which I did. Um but all along looking at the child and looking at my husband's face my, my husband was so excited. I mean he was there taking videos and taking photos and he wanted to take photos and I couldn't I didn't want to take photos. He told me to hold the baby. I didn't want to hold the baby. Um and this was primarily because once I looked at the baby The first thing that came to my mind was you made me go through this much pain. Such a little person made me go through such pain and I was so angry about that. And also seeing her 
I expected to see a mini me, but I didn't see anything. And that's when the thought of me being a baby carrier came. So I felt like all along, I've done my job. I've carried the baby. The baby is here. My job is done. I just carried this baby. So I'm seeing a baby who does not resemble anyone I know. I mean, my family or myself. And that was kind of hurtful because I knew what I expected my baby to look like. And this is something we don't talk about or rather we sweep under the rug. I mean, when you're pregnant, you're thinking, okay, I think this baby will look like him. I think the baby will look like me. You know, not we don't pay attention to looks. But for me, it actually hurt me that the baby didn't look like me. So that's when I just felt like my job was done. And I was like, you can have your child. So yeah, at that point, I knew I shouldn't be thinking like that. I knew that's not what moms do. I knew that's not a natural thing to think about immediately you get your baby. So immediately you get your baby, you're overwhelmed with all these emotions. But I shouldn't be thinking about you, you know, I was just carrying you, you know, like how could you put me through this? Those were the first thoughts that came when I saw her instead of, you know, oh my God, you are so beautiful. You're so lovely. You're, she was beautiful. Oh my God, she was so, so beautiful and so helpless that I, I really miss, I actually miss seeing that. But I was just like, but what you've put me through, no. So I knew that is not what I should be thinking. And I didn't talk about it. I shouldn't talk about it. I should be grateful. I should be happy that I'm a mother, that I have gone through the process well, that I have not, you know, that, that everything went well, that I've not had any complications. So I should be grateful. So that was not something I knew I could talk to anyone about. Uh, it was hard. <laughs> Sorry. <sighs> it was hard. It was hard. Because um, I just felt alone. I felt like I couldn't talk about it because <laughs> that would be absurd. I mean, this is a little life that you've brought forth, an innocent person. What kind, what, what, how would it make me look? You know, what kind of mother <sighs> does it make me? Uh, so our firstborn was born in October. Um, in, in Kenya now, that's like, it's getting rainy right um, and then now December is coming and the Sun is coming and all that stuff but six months later October November December January February in the middle of our summer I woke up and I I remember telling my mom oh the Sun is shining and then she said but it's been shining for a while you know so I was like what do you mean and I'm, I told her so she was asking me what's going on and I, I told her I feel like I feel lighter and I feel like it's warmer and the sun is shining and I feel lighter. I don't know. How, well, this comes from how my mom and I talk to each other. But so she was like, yeah, but you know, it, it has been warm for a couple of days. It's been brighter. And she's the first one who said, I think you've not been OK. And then when she said that is when I was like, what do you mean? And so she started describing, you know, you've not been yourself. Um, you've been low. No, so she's describing this thing and it sounds like she's talking about someone else. But somewhere at the back of my mind, I'm thinking, yeah, this actually, it's, it's, it is making sense. Anyway, you know, we move on, you know, but she's like, um, she's the first to sort of give me a clue that something is wrong, but I'm not the best person to give a clue because I'm like, okay, okay, cool. So I came back home now to my, you know, my matrimonial home. So it's just me and my husband. And I remember vividly coming up the stairs, holding the baby, coming into the house. I just went to my room and cried. I just cried while holding the baby as my husband was bringing in things from the car. 
And I remember he looked at me and just couldn't understand. Because what is it now? So I'm nursing my episiotomy. Cracked nipples. Breastfeeding is hard. Exhaustion. I'm so sleepy because I'd wake up about five times at night. And there's also the pressure. I, I was not knowledgeable. I didn't know that it's normal to go through these things. No one was talking about it. Or no one told me the other side of motherhood. I thought my child will come and I'll breastfeed normally. Breastfeeding will be, you know, it will be different for me. And, you know, I'll wake up, do my hair, you know, look good. Yeah, and snap back. And in two weeks, get my tummy back. So it was really, really hard for the first three months. At exactly about two, three months, I didn't want to be around my child which was very painful. It was not normal. I knew it is not normal. And I read a lot. So I read somewhere that if your feelings of sadness postpartum go beyond 10 days, which is baby blues, then you might be experiencing postpartum depression. I just read, but I was like, I can't be depressed. I don't think I'm depressed. I think these are just baby blues that have gone on for some time. At no point did anyone tell me there was something, well, not that no one told me, but no one came to me and said, I think you are going through postpartum depression. Because that thing didn't come. You just told, oh, maybe it's a baby blues. Or, you know, you're having a hard time adjusting. But there was no word for it in my world at that time for what this thing was. So as you can see, there were many what I, I realized later, many people were noticing something was not right, but no one had a word for it or something how they could help me so then i just said oh, okay cool then i got over it well quote unquote I, I i i went over the hump so i was like cool fantastic we're good we move and then the second born came and i went through the same thing and that's the first time someone said you might be going through something called postpartum depression and i remember saying what's that it sounds bougie it sounds Americanish, you know, they, they have a name for everything. So they were like, no, there's actually something that happens mostly a year, six months to a year. So you, you're done with the baby blues, but something, things don't get back to normal. Something happens a year later and that constitutes as postpartum depression. So it's in the second pregnancy, you know, the second, after the second birth that there was that word that came. But now I didn't want to attach myself to it because it's like attaching yourself to, uh, you know, a mental... And we're talking about... It's not like we're talking about 1904. This is 2013, 2014. If you look back, we were not having the mental health discussions we are having now. We didn't have names for so many things. There were names, yes, but they were for psychiatric problems. So the, the turnaround we've done has been in a very short window. So I didn't want to attach myself to this thing called postpartum depression because there's this feeling of if you, if you say, then you are, you know, if that makes sense. At times I'd want to be alone, especially the first three months. Most of the time I'd want to be alone in this house. I'd not want anyone around unless it's my husband. So no child, I didn't want a child around. I didn't want uh, our help around. I just wanted us to go back to how we were, just the two of us. So that would make my husband take up that extra, you know, just decide to, okay, it's morning, that's what she wants, let's leave. So, she, so he would leave with the baby and go visit his mom or my mom for the day. And I'm alone and I'd watch movies, eat. <laughs> You know, just enjoy my time here. But now it became, oh, could you also go tomorrow? Oh, it would be nice to go for a road trip. I think you guys should bond. Um, to, you know, he'd want to spend probably Sundays together and not have anyone come. So, you know, can we spend the Sunday together? I'm like, oh, yeah, but we can take the baby to Shags, to, the, to, to my mom's or his mom's, and then we can spend the day together. So it was very conditional. So I only wanted to bond with my husband 
when the baby was away. I didn't want the baby around because the baby interrupted our life. Um, the baby would also cry and I'd not pick the baby up. I'd not be concerned that the baby is crying. So I had a very good lady who took care of that baby like <laughs> her own child. Or the baby would cry at night and I'm not bothered to wake up. And she's right there next to me. And my husband would wake me up, you know, you know, just try and hold the baby. I'm like, no, I'm sleepy, I'm tired. To a point where I felt like I didn't like my child. So once I shared that with my husband and my family, very few members of my family, they intervened, they came, they saw me, I was encouraged, I was prayed for, just wasn't enough. So we decided to seek the help of a therapist. So I saw a therapist, a counselor, for about two sessions. And through her analysis, she advised us to see a psychiatrist who then diagnosed me with postpartum depression. By the third born, I was very wise. I said, hey, my friends, I don't care what this thing is. Um, it's me, we are one. So I remember immediately after I gave birth, I started looking for a therapist. And I said, this one, I'm not, fine, it'll come, but it won't find me flat-footed. Mm -hmm. So with the third pregnancy, as much as I was ready for, it's like, hey, postpartum, bring it on. Ah, it said, ah, man, this time I'm coming now with, with the army. And it came to the point where I was very suicidal. I, I remember I just started shutting down. I wouldn't open the curtains, which I had not gone through before. I would wake up and not want to leave the bed. I'd, uh, I'd not want to shower, I'd not want to eat. Like you open the curtains, like you've washed, you know, it was horrible. I remember I made a, a um, I was in a WhatsApp group with some girlfriends and I just, I don't remember what message I sent. I just said, guys, I just think I need help. I don't know what's going on, I just need help. So luckily one of the friends in that group is a psychologist. And I remember she just called me and said, stay on the phone, let me get you a therapist. So by the time she was calling, I was under the blankets, I was crying. I remember one time my husband sitting on the foot of the bed and asking me, like he was like, what, do you, what can I do? And this is the third pregnancy. So remember, I'm, I, I'm, I should have been wiser and smarter. Like by now I have the handbook. Um, but now this is the worst of it out of all. So he was sitting at the edge of the bed asking me what can he do. And I remember saying, I feel like I'm in a hole. I feel like I'm, I felt like I was in a hole. And everyone who was asking to help me was standing, and the hole is a grave, because I do remember feeling like it was nicely chongwad. It wasn't just a kashimo. And I told him, I feel like everyone is on the other side, putting their hand down and asking me to come up, and I can't. I couldn't, I couldn't leave that hole. And I remember thinking, I just want people to come and sit with me in this darkness. Um, yeah, so that was, it was a really, I'm, pro I'm probably glossing over a lot of things because I have makeup and I don't want to cry. <laughs> but it was the worst of the three, yet it should, in my mind, logically, be the one that I was dealing with the best, and that was the worst. So my friend calls me and says, tomorrow morning at 9 a.m., I'll never forget, Wednesday, 9 a.m., there'll be a therapist waiting for you on Isaac Gadanju. So... The only thing you have to do, you don't even have to shower at you. The only thing you have to do is get there. That's the only thing you have to do. And then now you take it from there. And so that's how I started one and a half years of therapy. Um, but now I wasn't even going in for postpartum depression. I was going in for suicide. It was so hard to vocalize how I feel and what I was going through because no one gets it. Nobody gets it. At some point, I thought I'm cursed because I was like, who goes through this? Motherhood is supposed to be so amazing. I just have a new baby. She's beautiful. Everyone seems to love her. So it was very hard to vocalize. But the day 
I vocalized and started talking about postpartum depression on my platform on Instagram. That's when people reached out through my DMs and told me that they went through something similar. But I'd classify all those DMs as mild depression. I never thought anyone would reach the level of depression that I have to a point where I'm resentful of my child. I didn't ever think that there's anyone who'd go through it until a friend reached out and told me, yeah, um, anytime they'd go to the clinic with her baby after she was born, she'd want to throw the baby out of the window. And I'm like, hmm, sounds familiar. So I was like, okay. So, so, so it happens. So I found my match, you know, I kind of found my match. I was like, okay, it's happened to someone else, you know. The rest are very mild. I felt like, you guys don't even know what you're talking about. Do you know what I'm going through? Looking at the window in my room and wanting to jump off. So I became also suicidal. I'd take pills to just, you know, try and kill myself. I thought of harming the child physically. And that's when my therapist sent me to a psychiatrist because I felt like maybe if, if the baby is not there, then I'll be fine. But I'd not throw her out of the window alone. If she goes, I go. Because I can't live with that guilt and the shame. So if we go, we go together. So I'd not be allowed to be with her alone in a room. Because thoughts of harming her were just... And that's why seeing her crying, I, I felt nothing. By the time you feel like doing something physical, then really crying will, ne will not make you feel any type of way. So the help I got um, through therapy and through, my husband had to come with me for a few sessions to just understand where this was coming from, and for me to also understand where this was coming from. So we had to take a few measures that were drastic to ensure that, first of all, I'm okay. So there were people who triggered me, I'd see and they trigger me, or there are people who would make comments that trigger me. So I'd get the comments that, oh, this baby doesn't, oh my God, this baby looks like, like him. You know, oh my God, this is so not you. So such comments would trigger me. Because again, I went back to thinking, oh yeah, you see, this is not my baby. I'm just a baby carrier. I mean, you know, to a point where right now I'm very sensitive when I say such things around people. I don't, I don't comment on children's looks. Whether she looks like the dad or the father, or sorry, or the mother, that's really not my problem. So we had to take a break from the things that triggered me, and even people. And some of these people were very close to us. So there was that. Um, we'd also take a few days on our own with my husband. So the baby would go home to my mom and dad's place or would go to his mom's place for a few days. And when she'd come back, I'd be, ooh, you know, I'd be looking forward, but that had to take like, I think five trips before I could look forward to having her. So there was a day she went, um, there, was a, there was a time she went, and on the second day, I just wanted to see her. Not to come back with her, I just wanted to see her. So I drove all the way home to just see her. I saw her for an hour and came back and I was satisfied. So that urge started building that, okay, she's going... But no, you know, so she'd go for seven days, then it becomes five, four, three, five. You know, it was up and down, up and down. So that's when I started looking forward to seeing her. I was also, so therapy, um, taking the precautions that we took, and also medication. The problem comes when you have to explain to someone who doesn't understand, and you don't know how to make them understand, and you end up concerning with people or feeling that someone is not there for you. But now that I sit here, I'm like, people were there for me. My mind didn't understand that, that. 
or my mind chose to look at the trash, right? But now I can sit here and say, oh, I remember someone, you know, some friends would call me. Um, my mom would, I mean, my mom was, my mom has been a, a solid rock. I'll give you an example. I remembered that for the first six months to almost a year of the firstborn, my mom was in the house every day. She didn't live next with me, with us. She lived in Siokimao and we were living like on this side of town. She was there every day. So remember my mind has chosen to look at trash. I don't, rem I don't remember this until after nine years. It hits me that I remember her being there every day. She's the one who did our grocery, our vegetable shopping. So her, being the kikuyu she is, she bought the, the vegetables. She knows, akina carrot, you know, miji, all these things. She's the one who um, taught the nanny what to cook for me. So suddenly my house had fruits, there was fruit salad, there was, there was scheduled meals, you know. And it takes me nine years to realize that that's what she was doing in that period of time that I now wasn't, I was, I was so myopically processing my situation and not even making headway. Now, that's the only way my family eats. So you see, that's help. That's support, that's love. Then it didn't feel like it. I had support from my sisters, my family, my mom. I had a lot of support again from my husband. I had a lot of support from my very close friends. Because remember, this is not something you can just share with anyone. I felt, or rather that's what I felt, for fear of judgment and I didn't want to put myself in that mental space again. So, even the physical support, you know, there was a time a sister of mine and her husband just drove in, came here, and told us to go. And the baby was about two months, told us to leave. So, like, leave and, yeah, you guys, just go for a drive. Come back whatever time you want to come back. We'll take care of the baby. So, that really helped. I needed people to physically come and tell me, you know what? Yeah. Or at night. I needed help at night. So my husband also stepped in. So because I didn't want to... I'm a light sleeper. So because I didn't want to wake up from the baby's cry, he had to move with the baby to the next room. Which is... I'll always remain forever grateful for that. And not many people would understand. And I don't expect people to understand. But he actually did it. There are times they'd sit here all night because she'd wake up so many times. And you know, he's playing his games, he's watching soccer all night, and they fall asleep here because they don't want to wake me up. So even when I started getting my full night sleep, my attitude would change in the morning. Yeah. So I received a lot of physical support. Emotional support was good as well. Um, but when it came to emotional support, not many people made sense. People would encourage me from their point of view, you know. Um, I'd always be encouraged, you know. You know, at the end of the day, you're this child's mother. It kind of helped, but what really helped was just people showing up. Showing up is is what I really appreciated the most. Um, so it's been it's been a year. My child is one. Um, surprisingly, since she, towards ten months from ten months, going up has been good, better. Um. I'm on, I'm on medication um, that has really it's, real, it's really helping me um, in therapy as well. Um, I'm much better. I'm not in a hurry to stop. I wanted to quit you know the medication because I was like, okay, look, I can't take medi I can't take I can't take antidepressants for the rest of my life. Um, but I'm encouraged to still proceed, to still continue. 
until the doctors feel like I'm at a more sane place, but I'm much, much better. I feel a bond with my child, even if I can't breastfeed. Um, now it's dealing with not blaming myself for what I went through. Because now there are times I will get frustrated because I've placed the baby on my boob and she doesn't know what it is. She, you know, she thinks it's a game because she doesn't know. She's not used to breastfeeding. So now I'm like, now I want to breastfeed. Now I'm like, I want to take back all those things because I'll never get them back. You know, I want to breastfeed my child. I want to develop a bond with her that's so strong that she can never experience with anyone else. Because breastfeeding, your child will never experience another bond like breastfeeding. But I don't, I can't do that now. So I try as much as I can to bond with her, whether it's through showering. There are things I avoid as well, things that trigger me. So feeding triggers me a lot. Um, because, you know, she's also at that age where she's very particular with what she wants to eat. And if she doesn't eat, it really triggers me. So I know what to do. I know what to do when that time comes. Because when it gets to me, then I get, I can get physical. So what will happen is I'll leave the house until it's done. Come back. And, you know, just breathe in and just breathe out and just go with the flow but I am um, I, I can't I, I, I didn't think I'd come out of that dark space I was in and even this space I'm in I think it can be better it's not anyone's fault yeah it doesn't make you less of a mom it doesn't make you less of a parent um, I know there are some single moms who are doing it alone and I salute them. But you're doing such an incredible job. I used to be told that and I never saw it. Because I was like, how could I be doing an incredible job? And I'm like this towards my child. So, yeah, it doesn't make you less of a parent. Yeah. And you're, you're doing well and you'll come out of it. You definitely will come out of it. And your story is your story, so you've got to own it. Yeah. Um, I'd like to tell uh, my child that I love her, that it wasn't, it's not her fault, it was never her fault, that I was just healing from whatever wounds I had, and that it won't make her less of her daughter. She's loved so, so much. And I'm working extremely hard to ensure that she knows she's loved. I really don't want to break her. When she sees this, I'll, I'll talk to you about it. I'll talk to her about it one day. <sighs> but I'm not making excuses. It just, it wasn't my fault. And that she's she's loved. Yeah, I don't want her to develop any issues with me. I'm working at getting better. Yeah. And talking about it really helps. It's very therapeutic. I also want to thank my family for being supportive, not questioning or judging um, what I went through. My close friends, um, Ms. Shiro, Wanzaji, you know, and many others. We thank you for, for just standing in the gap with me. These are people who don't have kids. But, you know, they've 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 taken this baby as their own. Yeah. Taking care of her. 
coming, picking her up, just taking care of her. I also want to thank um, my husband for being the mom when I couldn't be a mom. For going through his fair share of pain because he questioned, I'm sure he questioned um, a lot. And um, for his support system because he also needed therapy to be able to make sense out of the situation and I still encourage him to seek more therapy and for my mom for praying for me every day and not judging me as a fellow mother yeah and my siblings well, I have I just can't explain yeah thank you and for this platform we needed this platform to talk i feel safe in this platform i feel like i'm home in this platform and i hope someone out there will hear this story and be encouraged that hey i'm okay or that they will get better